Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be invited to speak with you today here. A brief introduction of myself. My name is Hassan. I am based in Singapore. I am with the company, the Center of Applied Data Science, short for CATS. Um, what we do is we advocate, we are big advocate of data literacy in both organizations in the private as well as public sector. A very brief introduction of what CATS is about. Um, as you can see from the slides, we believe very much in data-driven decision-making. The founding team, as well as for our founder, Sharala, they started with a mission to make all organizations, both public as well as private, to become data-driven organizations. When it comes to data, when it becomes data-driven organizations, what that means is all your decision-making, all the, 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 the work that you're doing, it has to be, it has to be data-driven performance driven, but that is easier said than done. To achieve organizations to become data driven, what do you need? You require data literate workforce because today you can buy, you can spend the money to buy the best technology and there are many good technologies out there, but who is gonna operate on them? Who's gonna make the best use of them? It is the workforce. It's, it is the people like you and I and the rest of, 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 of us to make the best of the technology. We need, data literate workforce to build data-driven organizations. And that's what CATS is about. And we truly, fully believe in that. That's a very brief introduction. We'll share a bit more of what we do. But at this point, I think we'll move into our main theme for today, which is how big data can be used for social causes. I would like to share with you a video to begin with. We are living in revolutionary times. There are now more cell phones on the planet than there are people. Almost every activity we perform online is digitized, and we are instrumenting our globe with sensors across land, air, and sea. And the massive amounts of data that are pouring off these devices means we have more information to learn about our world, about our communities, and about ourselves than ever before. Now, big data is not just a business trend, no, it's nothing less than a new age of reason. And yet, so far, Silicon Valley and Wall Street have pretty much exclusively harnessed this wonderful new power to sell people stuff. Yeah, Amazon uses data pr to predict what you want to buy. Netflix uses data to predict what kind of movies you want to see. That's all well and good, but it feels like we're squandering this opportunity on painfully first world problems. But what if we could deliver vaccines as effectively as Amazon routes its packages? What if we could predict the spread of disease as easily as we predict movie ticket sales? And what if small health organizations had access to the same algorithms that big tech companies are using to boost their profits to instead boost impact? Well, that world is possible and it starts with people. We've been connecting data scientists from tech companies like Facebook and Microsoft to volunteer alongside nonprofits and foundations so that they can collaborate and build predictive technologies for social impact. And in, in the over 165 projects we've done, we've seen teams do everything from use satellite imagery to estimate poverty, to write algorithms to help teens in crisis connect to the counseling they need. And the really cool part about this is it's not just about the data, no, it's actually about collaboration. And that means that there is a role for all of us to play in this. Whether you're a data scientist, a nonprofit, or even just an ordinary citizen, we need you around the table shaping these solutions. Because it's really only when we all come together to use data for good, that we can go beyond just using data to make better decisions about the kind of movies we want to see. And we can start using data to make better decisions about the kind of world we want to see. Thanks. Thank you. So you've just seen from the video just now, data for good. So data can be used in many ways. I think we've heard of that many times. But at the same time, why big data? Why big data is, just checking if you can hear me, why big data is important for social causes. What have they done in terms of helping social causes? What you're looking at is the United Nations Sustainable De Development Goals. There's 17 of them. And big data is, play, is playing a very critical role in helping to move forward to achieve these goals. If you look at these goals, there are no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, affordable clean energy, industry innovation, sustainable cities, and responsible consumption. Many of these topics that we are talking about, they, the reason they need to be addressed because they 
at the moment are problems that the world is facing. And these problems are not caused by yesterday, problems by, by, by since yesterday or last year, the year before. It has been accumulated over the years when human advancing our technology, our society, at the same time that we created a lot of these problems along the way. How big data can actually come into the picture to help us to solve this problem is, we can actually look into the historical data that we have accumulated over these years, such as population movement, such as birth rate, such as tax data, financial data, climate data. When you look at all that putting together and try to understand how the world has come to today and all these problems, then by understanding those issues, we might be able to find a better way forward to solve these problems. But what we are talking about, data from all these years, it is a huge, a large amount of data. If you're talking about using just pen and pencil, it is not going to solve it. If you're talking about even just Excel that many of us use, it's not going to solve the problem. And I know that just now that the, 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 the previous speaker was talking about using different tools. Big data, big data analysis, the tools that we can make use of will allow us to analyze this huge amount of data in a much shorter time so that it will give us a better understanding to move forward how to tackle these problems. Now, what you're looking at here we're sharing is the benefits of using big data for social causes. If you look at what we have shared here, such as flood issues, climate issues, and crime prediction, it is not simply solving the problem of what we are seeing, um, the crimes of whether we put more police on the, on, the, on the street to stop crimes. We're actually looking at the fundamental issues of why crime happened in certain areas. For example, because of economic data or because of education level or because of um, work availabilities in certain areas. If you, we might talk about that, we would say in certain areas, if there are no jobs, the crime might be actually higher. But is that the only reason? If there are no, if, if, if the education is low, why is that the case? Is it because of the, the schools are not as close? So people who are in those areas are harder to get education? So there are many, many factors would actually contribute to certain um, the, the, the things that could happen. And in this particular um, case we are talking about, it can lead to crime to happen. So if we can actually look at the data in the past years and understanding why that is leading to this particular case, then they'll be able to help us to identify better solutions to solve the problem. Now, looking at floods, floods is also another area which is caused by climate. I think in the last two or three years while we're suffering from the pandemic. At the same time, we've seen a lot more typhoons, floods happening around us in the region. Why is that the case? Is this something that we can do? And people are talking about the climate change because of the, the carbon or the, the, the energy that we're using. We are always producing carbon, but there's not a matter of just one year, two years. It might not even be just happening in the immediate area that we are in. It can be coming from other areas beyond ASEAN as well. But how do we know if that is the case unless we have data to look into? But when we are talking about data such as weather data, and they are available, but they are also exist in a large, very large amount as well. So in order for us to have a better understanding, we need to make use of big data analysis skills as well as tools to allow us to go into having a better understanding of the world that we're living in. What we have cited here is only a few problems that, that, that we're facing, but beyond that, there's a lot more that we can actually tackle in our current, in our current society. And if you're looking to the right, these are some of the universities who are already taking part and they're already doing a lot of work in these areas to solve the problems that we're facing today. What I have shared with you here is why big data is important um, to help solve social causes and the benefits of doing that. And today we have prepared two case studies to share with you and how um, companies as well as social enterprise making use of data and big data to solve some of the problems that we have been facing with recently. 
You might be familiar with them. If not, we'll go into details a bit more. So the first one is Kita Jaga. The other one is Verify Hala. Let me just go into, first of all, the um, Kita Jaga. Kita Jaga is an app that is created in Malaysia and during the pandemic time. Kita Jaga, it was created during the pandemic time in Malaysia. And this is created because you can see this map here is because of what happened when you use a Kita Jaga is matching the needs and those who want to provide the needs. Let's go into putting a bit more context. Malaysia has been battling with COVID-19 for the last almost two years. And during the lockdown, there were a lot of needs um, in the society. And the, this is how the white flag campaign came about. And the, 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 the team at Gita Jaga came to realize that many of the people, because when they are in the lockdown and they will not be able to seek help or even the help cannot be able, is not able to reach out to them. So they have come up with an app to bring these two together, the help as well as those who need help. If you're looking at the, the numbers here in the second point, Malaysia police recorded 468 suicides in 2021. And in 2020, 631. So this year's suicide is almost as close as to the whole year of 2020, as well as 20, 2019. And these are the problems that's caused by pandemic because of the lockdown, caused by family problems, as well as emotional pressures and finances. So those people in need in a society, help cannot reach out to them. Kita Jaga came about to help provide this help and matching them. A team, Tarato Tech in Malaysia, they want to make it easy for users to access curated information for help to help those in need. And when they go to the, they, they go to the platform, they have the ability to identify where the help is by looking at where the, where the white flag is. And this is what they have put together. When someone go to the app and they look at all the white flags and all the identified areas, they will be able to provide help. Let's say if I'm someone that, if I'm lucky enough to be in a position to, pro to provide help, and I come, I actually use the app, open the app and look at where the white flags are. And then if the right flag is actually close to where I stay, then I will be able to go and help these people, or I can actually let my friends know to go and help these people. The challenges for the, for the team at Kita Jaga is, is how do they actually um, maintain, enhance them and maintain the platform. Um, of course, when they do that, there is also a cost um, issue to that as well. And to make sure Kita Jaga, they have to keep running it, the quality of work, they also need people to come forward. But why do we actually talk about this particular Kita Jaga and how big data actually helps them to bring, to achieve their objective? Let me just share a bit more with you. The platform of Kita Jaka, what they set out to do is bringing the, matching the needs, matching for those who need the help and those who want to volunteer the help. And if you are talking about from a small community, for example, if I want to help my neighbors, that is easy enough to do because I can just reach out to the neighbors if they want to help, I can actually extend the help. But if you're talking about going from a small community to 10 people, to 100 people, to 1,000 people, to hundreds and thousands of people during the pandemic, those who suffer from the, the, the pandemic. How do you actually bring these people together? So Kita Jaga, by looking at the data, they actually, they, they, they actually harness. And using big, big data analysis, they will be able to match by looking at the data, looking at those in need and see where they are coming from. Because when those in need, they will actually provide certain data such as where are they based? What do they actually need? And um, what kind of help do they actually need? And when do they actually need this help? And then on the other side is for those who want to help, they will be able to provide data as in what kind of help they want to offer, where they can offer. Because if you're based in certain areas, you might not be able to help in different areas or if they can donate, what can they donate, how much they can donate. When if you get a jaga sitting in the middle, when they have all this data, they would be able to look at, identify, match. For those who are living in the same area, those who need and those who can provide the help together. 
or if they don't stay in together, they can actually look in for those who need to help in certain areas, who need to be helped in certain areas and group them together. Then you find those who can donate the help. Let's say if they're donating money, they can collect those money and they can find a better way to buy those products needed and send these to the people. But you won't be able, you, you don't have to need to do it one by one. But now the problem that you might face is if you're talking about one or 10 people or 20 people, we can do it with pencil and paper to do the matching. You, can even, you might even be able to do it with Excel as well. But if you're talking about hundreds and thousands of people on both sides, those in need and those who, want, who, who, who can help, how do you actually analyze the data and bring them together? And this is where big data can actually come in to help very, very quickly. What they can do is they can analyze the data and bring them together. And the other area is if you are talking about using Excel, using just doing matching, you need more people to do that. When you want more people, you might want to get volunteers to help you. But what if you can't get volunteers? You will need to hire people. When you need to hire people, what that means is you have to pay them. You will pay them that is a cost. So that cost, many a time we have heard from people providing donations. They say that if I am providing donations, I want the donations to go directly to those in need instead of going to people that who is helping to make, to, to do the matching, to do the, to, to the writing down and all that. But those are needed in order to help the people. So what big data can actually do is it can help to solve these kind of problems to bring to, to, to because of so much data is generated on both sides. Big data helps you in the shortest time possible to find the matching, that is how big data can help. So I just talk about that in terms of the, 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 the matching and the donations. Um, one more thing that big data can help uh, in this kind of situation is uh, it can also authenticate people to build trust and safety as well. Um, do you know that if people who are providing help, if they are safe and can be trusted, we know that during the Gita Chaka time, and because there are people who can provide help, but there can be there, there also suspicious activities happen, people who might not be genuine, but they said they can help. For example, in a very bad way, maybe robbers who want to actually go and rob people during those times. But if you're using Gita Chaka, if you're using data, you actually have the ability to authenticate and build trust and safety. And by looking at their track record and the reviews, for those who have been helping people using the platform, they will build a certain track record and those track record can be validated by those who receive the, who receive the help, also from the reviews as well. So you'll be able to build a certain profile and understanding of the people that, who are helping the others. But at the same time, what you can also do is for those who are actually receiving help, you'll be able to build a certain profile of what they have been receiving. Yes, during pandemic time, help is needed for many, many people. And you want to be able to share those help to as many people as possible. But what if you have been certain individuals or certain community have been receiving, receiving help all the time? You want to make it as fair as possible. Then the platform with data, you will be able to distribute the help equally so that over time you can donate, you can, you can, you, you can distribute the help to as many people as possible without just focusing in one certain areas so that we can all come out from the pandemic and get through these tough times together. So that's, yeah. Luckily, now we are towards the end of 2021. Pandemic is under control. The number of white flags is actually dropping. And the big, data gen, the big data analysis actually has generated a lot of data. And you may ask the question, so would big data with this data will still be relevant? The fact of the matter is the data generator and using big data is actually will still remain very relevant because we have now a better understanding of what help is, 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 is needed during pandemic situation. You might come across WHO, World Health Organization, they have warned that we might be faced with more serious pandemic situations in the near future. We don't want that to happen. What if that happens? What we have done today, what Kida Jaga has done today with the data they have generated and also the, 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 the understanding. 
we are in a better situation to handle pandemic, the next pandemic, if should it come. But at the same time, with this data, we're talking about data of the profiles of people in need, as well as people who can actually provide health. This is not just about being pandem in pandemic. In situations where many a time we talk about, for example, we face with natural disasters, whether it is flood, whether it is weather, storm, or that our communities get affected. In those situations, communities also need help as well. The understanding that Chikita Jaga has garnered today will really, really help in, in getting, it will really help us to understand how we can actually get help to those in need as well. That's where I want to share with you how big data can be used in a very significant way to address a social cause. And this is kudos to Kida Jaga in taking this initiative, in creating this platform um, during these really difficult times to help many of those people in need. But what they have done is not just simply for today, it's also for to prevent, to help should disaster strike again in the future. Solutions, as we were talking about, there are different white, white flags um, and help provide that. These are some of the statistics. Um, today, that there's more than, I think today is more than, this one is slightly earlier, 1.6 million. Today is more than 2 million visitors who already have visit, visited the platform. So that one was Kita Jaga that we share with you. Um, if you have any questions, we'll have Q&A uh, towards the end of this presentation. We'll be happy to, um, answer any questions or discuss with you as well. Verify Halal. This is address a real problems that the Muslim community has been facing for many, many years. In particular, when they're traveling overseas, the Muslim community want to get truly Halal certified products. But the problem is, as you and I know, sometimes very difficult to get the real authentic certified products. So it is not, a good experience, although you might buy the product but the product says, and you found out that it is not truly halal certified. So the entrepreneur, Ms. Shari, realized that there's a real problem and there's a real need to address this. And then she came up with um, Veriva Hala to help to solve the problem. Some of you may have used it. What Veriva Hala has been doing, how do they actually make use of data to help to solve the problem? They have been building a database of accredited halal suppliers, manufacturers, product service providers, buyers, retailers in the globe, in the global marketplace, not just in Malaysia, not just in ASEAN, but in the global marketplace. There's a huge database. And on top of that, they're also building out a database of certifications and the validity of the certifications and the expiry date, because the certificate is not. It's not never ending. They also have expiry date. And if you're buying from someone that who has, got, yes, the merchant might have, might have a, a, um, a certificate three years ago, but they didn't, they, didn't, they didn't renew it a year ago. They still carry that trademark. Would you feel safe to buy from this particular merchant? So what Verify Hala is looking into the ecosystem and building a database and a tracking system to understand, to track all these certifications, expiry date, the validity are all up to what they claim. At the same time, they're also building a tracking of all the product range as well. This is a huge amount of data that they're tracking and they're building because it's a global marketplace. You're not talking about just one country. You have multiple suppliers, multiple verticals, and multiple bodies that you need to adhere to as well. But while they build this particular database, what they also can do is it's not a one-way communications, because all these players, all these um, businesses, they exist in an ecosystem and they also do business with each other as well. While they're doing that, they also help to verify if they are truly what they claim to be, whether they're really HALA certifi HALA certified. And if they are, that's great. And the system will be able to capture that as well. So these data generator from the information through the interactions between the authorities, the industry, and most important of all, between all the customers. Because what we're talking about is different companies working on one side, 
and in the ecosystem. But who is buying all these products? Who is consuming all these products? The customers. The customers is ultimate users who will validate if they're really what they claim to be. Verify Hala will do that, but the customers are the ultimate who use. We're talking about a global population, a global Muslim community who is doing the validation. When they have consumed the product, they will make reviews, they will share the experience, and Verify Hala will be able to capture that and cross reference with the claims that is being laid out by different merchants as well as businesses as well. Intent outcome. As I mentioned earlier, because of the constantly when the app is, when the, 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 the Verify Hala is being used by different parties, constantly the reviews, the requests and the comments by different customers around the world, they're providing data to Verify Hala to validate the claims by people within the ecosystem. And big, big, big data and big data analysis is coming through, is helping Verify Hala to build very trustworthy profiles of food companies. Now that address a problem that we talked about before because companies claim that they, their food is halal certified. But now it has got ev it's evidence-based. It is fact-based, it is data-backed is data -backed that what they claim is a fact. And consumers also, consumers can also verify that as well. So what happens is you create a trustworthy food companies in the ecosystem that customers can actually turn to. What they do is continuously, they can also to, what Verify Hala also set out to do, now they're in the ecosystem, they want to continue to improve the integrity of the data. How do they do that? They actually go deeper into the production chain. And what, this, what does that mean? What, what, what does that mean is, they work with some food suppliers, the food suppliers will make the claims, but if they go further deep into the food production chain, what they do is they will even go to the raw materials farmers as well as the food manufacturers. And they want to verify the production process is also halal compliant as well. While they're building this capability and they started introducing the IoT, which is the internet of things to help monitor the process. You might think, why IoT? How would IoT come into the picture? How will IoT help to make things better in terms of the halal compliant food chain? When you're doing food production, when you're at the abattoir, when animals are being slaughtered, there are certain ways that it needs to be halal compliant. The IoT, for example, what they have done is they put cameras in the factories to observe how the process is being done. And they use artificial intelligence to put into the camera to look at the whole process, to identify if the right process is being followed or if the wrong process is being followed, if mistakes, if mistakes are made, they will be able to alert the system. Now, if it is a genuine mistake, it can be corrected, but if it's a wrong process, then that company will be alerted to Verify Hala. Then Verify Hala will be able to look into this company to see if they are still Hala compliant, should they still exist in the ecosystem? Or they can use this data to feed back to the, the, the food manufacturer so that they can improve their process. But while they're doing that, what they're doing is they're building a platform, they're building a system, allowing different stakeholders to continue to have their data, to have their input and claims verified. And while they're doing the verification, the verification, they will generate a lot of the data that is, that is, that is, that is used to verify um, who are truly HALA compliant. As time goes, of course, it's not going to happen overnight. It will take time because data would be generated. You need to verify. As time goes, they will continue to build a very strong understanding of the HALA food industry. And they will be able to identify the good actors as well as the bad actors. Now, Coming back to the point of how big data analysis is being used and it can actually help a social cause. Because of technology, because of the data being generated, if you leave the data behind and not doing anything about it, then it will be just data. They're just numbers from zero to nine. But until you start analyzing the data and start cross-checking, then you will be able to, for example, in the previous speaker, use the tools available you'll be able to draw insights. 
the insights will be able to help the system to continue to improve. But at the same time, what Verify Hala as a byproduct will also create as well as is, they will also start understanding the customers much, much better because they're targeting not just one country, they're targeting a global market. And they know that as long as they're providing Hala certified food, the true authentic ones, the customer will come to them. While they're doing that, they will also be able to, if you just think about the e-commerce of today, look at Amazon, you look at Shopee, look at Lazada, they are doing products. What they're doing is they're understanding the needs, the consumption behavior, the preference of the customers. Very Hala at the same time can do that as well, but they focus on the Muslim community. And they will know in terms of the food preferences, the pricing information, and when do they want, they need certain product. This is consumption behavior. What will give them? This will allow them to go back to the food supplier and give them the information or share with them the information. This is what is needed. And because of that information, it will actually help the food production process, the sourcing process to be much more efficient. Efficiency is supposed to drive down the cost. If they can actually drive down the cost, what it means is that cost can be transferred to the customers. The customers in the future would be able to enjoy a better choice of food, a HALA compliant with, with confidence, but at the same time, better quality, quality of food as well as a lower cost. So if you can make use of data in a really, really smart way, you'll be able to drive better quality and better costing as well. And that's what Verify HALA is set out to do and they will be able to, to, achieve, um, to, to, to achieve that. Some of the challenges I mean, we spoke about earlier just now, and this is, um, if you go to the website and this is what you can see is available on there, on there, on the, on the app in terms of the product, in terms of the companies, as I mentioned earlier, because they have got different stakeholders on the platform who will provide um, uh, information of their products and as well as the certifications of their products. So you'll be able to see all of that on there, on there, on there, on there, on the, on the app. So these are solutions um, that we spoke about as well. And one of the strong, uh, the, the, the credibility for Verify Hala is they're the first Jakim approved, approved platform. And because of that, they can actually make a lot of credible claims and to continue to build the, 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 the solutions that they have. So what we have shared with you is two case studies. Um, that, that we feel that it is relevant, um, how big data is used to help to solve um, social problems, social causes. Of course, it can actually help in many, many other ways. Um, the fact of the matter is, I mean, today, um, if you're talking about not just commercial organizations, we're talking also about charity organizations, both public, public as well as private. Many of our consumption, Many of the things that we do, we actually do it on our iPhone, we do it on our computers. Once we do that, or we flip it to the other side, the end, user, the end users are doing that on the platform. Every decision they make, every decision, every decision that they don't make, they're generating a huge amount of data. And when the data has been generated, more and more customers and more and more spending more and more time on our phones as well as our platforms. The data that is being generated is, is only, only going to get bigger and bigger. And if you are able to understand the, the, how these data are making sense, why you make certain decisions, I want, to, I want to share this with you. When you make a decision, for example, if you are going to, um, to, 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 to an e-commerce platform and you make certain decisions that you want to buy something or not to buy something, what you have done is you are make one click and make that decision. Then that decision is a piece of data generated. But at the same time, there are many data points and many data is generated from that particular input as well. When you make that decision, where you make that decision, the location you make that decision because this platform can track that. Who are you? Who are you who make that decision? What is your age? What is your gender? 
where are you making that decision in terms of whether it is on a computer, whether it is on a phone? What decision have you made before that decision and what decision you might be making in the future? All of that is just a very simple snapshot. It is actually much bigger than that. There are more, every one decision, there's multiple number of other decisions is being made and this being captured by companies, by merchants and by platforms. So that will allow you to allow the companies to make a better understanding of your decision-making process. And you go back to the other side, when we talk about data-driven organizations, whether you're private, whether you're charity, when all your customers are talking to you, communicating with you using computers, using mobile phone, they're giving you lots of information about their consumption behavior. Now, if you make good use of this consumption behavior, what that means is you'll be able to provide your services and your products to them in a much more effective and efficient manner. And this is where big data comes in. As I said, every decision, there's multiple points. And when you're spending your time on the computer and on the mobile phone, can you count how many decisions you make on a daily basis? Every click you make on your phone is a decision. For one person, for a family, for a community, for a city, for a state, for a country, all that on a daily basis, trillions of data are being generated from businesses. But what it also means is if you want to take part today in the economy in the future, having the skills to understand data, having the skills to make, create, to extract insights from data is extremely important. If you want to actually put your skills to even better use to help social causes to do good, that is even more important and they need people really with good analytic skills. Because as we talked about earlier from the United Nations, the, SG, the, the, the SDGs, the social development goals, these are big economic social problems that the world is facing. Even if you're presenter, you wanna do good, if you're presented with these problems and you're presented with data of your country, of the last 30 years in terms of financial data, in terms of uh, demographic data, in terms of weather data. You need the skills, the data analytic skills to go into this data, to make understanding. Then you'll be able to come up with better solutions to move forward, to help those in need. So that's where um, I would like to share with in terms of the two case studies. I have another video that I would like to share with you in the next one. You have seen him before. Let me just bring it up and he will share a bit more with you in terms of how data is being used in different areas to do good. Imagine a world where every social organization has the same ability to use data and artificial intelligence as big tech companies. Imagine if the same algorithms that Google and Facebook are using to boost profits could instead boost impact. When we're talking about data and technology, there's almost no limit to the problems that are solvable. I'm Jake Porway, the founder and executive director of Data. Companies have gotten quite good at using data and algorithms to drive profits. You need think no further than Netflix recommending movies for you to watch, Google Maps determining which routes you should take, these big, well-resourced organizations have really dramatically changed our lives. But the opportunity now is to take that same technology to the front lines of social change. The same way that a package is delivered intelligently by UPS based on traffic and weather could also be used to determine where a vaccine could travel most effectively. Data and algorithms could be used to distribute food to people in need or to track poachers who are harming animals. But the big challenge right now is that it is incredibly expensive for social organizations to do that. So at DataKind, we're trying to bridge the gap between folks who have the technological skills and those who understand social problems that need changing. There's actually a healthy and robust volunteer community of folks who are experts in computer science, technology, that want to give their time back to social challenges. And so we create teams of technologists that work alongside nonprofits, governments, and social entrepreneurs to advance their mission. For example, our DataKind UK chapter 
worked with a nonprofit organization, Global Witness. They looked at an open registry that Global Witness keeps about corporations all across the UK. And by diving into that data, they found all sorts of corrupt activities. And as a result of exposing this, the UK government cracked down on those corporations, and more than that, now set up legislation where 28 EU countries are going to be required to have similar open registries so this corruption never happens again. So this to me is an example of how even a short-term engagement around data and technology can dramatically help society. But for us, it's not enough just to create interesting projects or to help a few groups. For us, data for good means data for all. And that means we need to create funding and training and resourcing so that everyone around the world, across every country, every demographic, every culture, has the ability to use this new technology ethically and capably. Because when they do, we can truly use data science and artificial intelligence in the service of humanity. Imagine a world where every social. So data for good is data for all. So I think we all have a role to play in, 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 in driving, um, making big data uh, to help social causes. And that's the theme that we have today. So um, I have prepared two case studies and that's what we have shared with you. And I'll come to uh, the a bit of the introduction of what CATS is about. Um, that's what we do as well. I think earlier you saw this particular slide. Um, it was just a few slides just to give you a bit more of what we advocate and why we believe um, the importance in this particular area. Um, we are, I'm based in Singapore. Um, Singapore is our headquarter, but we have a very strong presence in Malaysia. We've been working with different um, social organizations and charity in Malaysia, as well as universities. And we're also expanding very quickly in Indonesia, in Philippines and Thailand. What we, as I said earlier, we believe very much that all organizations need to be data-driven. How we do things, it has to be of a data-driven mentality, data-driven mindset. And the data literate workforce is a must for the future. For Southeast Asia, um, where we are, we have got a 650 million people and we have, we're the number three, um, the biggest, um, uh, populous area in the world. We have many resources, we have many great opportunities coming through, and we believe that our youth in the region, um, it is must to have data analytics skills, because for the future where we're living on the internet, we're living with digitalization, this cannot avoid the fact that data will continue to generate, it will only generate a lot more. Having data analytics skills is almost prevalent across all departments in companies and all facets of life. So we uh, have been providing training programs in the region and we continue to, 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 to do that. Um, this is something that uh, I think it was shared by, 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 by the host earlier as well. Uh, I'll just talk a little bit about that. So we advocate in terms of how data literacy is important uh, in the society, in both organizations as well as the do good foundations as well. So what we have done is, apart from what, apart from advocacy, what else we can do? We actually have a platform. We will help um, individuals as well as organizations to verify their data analytics skills. We spend a lot of time understanding what kind of data data analytics skills is needed in today's society. We talk about data analytics skills. It's not just about using Excel, using using um, calculating the data is a lot more than that as well. There's programming skills, there's understanding of statistics. It is not that bad. It's actually fairly straightforward. So we have actually built a system to assess, but at the same time, we also want to share with the, the, the individuals as well as companies, yes, if there's a gap, how can you actually close that gap as quickly as possible by using different interventions or training programs? And when you actually have managed to close those gaps, then you also need to get certified because we know that today and in the future, the, the demand for data professionals will only get higher and higher. If you simply look at the two case studies that we spoke about earlier, Kida Jaga as well as Verifa Hala, they are solving a business problems. They're solving a problem, a social problem, but enabling them to build their business, to scale up at a global, at a, at a, at a global scale, they need to 
look at data, they didn't make use of data on a daily basis. And if you believe in their cause, you want to join them to keep helping people, what can you offer them? If you have the data analytics skills to help them to solve problems as quickly as possible, to identify the needs as quickly as possible by looking at data, then you're doing a good job. You need the skills to do that. So that's what our platform is built to serve those needs, to help the workforce, to help individuals to improve the data analy and analy analytic skills as quickly as possible and also to expose them to the working community. So we all have our very unique blanks of skills and we all actually have the mindset, but sometimes it's a matter of focus. So our platform and also our, our philosophy is to help you to focus that data analytics skills, to data literacy is, is a very important area that will help you to improve your well-being. So these are some of the partners that we work with um, in the region, not just in Malaysia and in Singapore, in Indonesia and in different areas as well. Um, we know for a fact that these organizations are looking for data professionals. If you look at some of these organizations, these are consultancies and these are banks and these are conglomerates and they're transforming themselves into digital business. They need digital profession data professionals to handle all the data being generated from their customers to get better insights, to get better business competitive advantages. So these are the partners that we have been working with. Um, so we want to share with this is the, the last couple of slides that I want to share with you. Um, project 2100 is a project that we as a company, uh, we believe very strongly in and we are, and we have been, we've been actively working uh, on this as well. Uh, project, project, project 2100, we want to future-proof the use and the workforce to become data literate um, for the way forward. Um, I think you and I know that in the last two years during the pandemic, many of the many jobs have been lost. The particularly hard hit segment is actually the graduates as well as youths as well. Because of the lockdown, they couldn't go to school. Many of them, they might not have the ability to learn online as well. And as I said earlier, ASEAN, we have 650 million people and it is one of the most promising region in the world. We have many opportunities coming through in this area. But because of the job losses over the last two years, many of the youths as well as the young graduates, they have been affected severely. And what that means is it could actually translate into something very severe for our region in the near future. It could be a huge skill gaps that, that we would not be able to fill because many of our youngsters have been affected in terms of education during the pandemic. And we believe that is a serious problem that we have to address and we can't do it alone. We want to have partners who can come and join us to advocate this and to really push this, put this agenda to the private sector, to the public sector and to charity organizations to raise their awareness of this. Although we're coming out from the pandemic, but there's a lot of work to be done. And in the five countries that we have set out to launch, it is in Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, and Philippines, that many of us are tuning in from today. So in this project, we will actually create many engagement opportunities to advance, to advocate what we believe in, but we're also putting in free courses. We believe in data literacy. We believe in data analytics courses and data analytics skills. So we put out, we work with different partners such as Udemy, LinkedIn Learning to put out free courses in this area to allow our youth to continue learning and hopefully close these gaps caused by the pandemic. And we've launched this and we have launched this Project 2100. And it is, as I said, it is not just one, one company or one entity or one person project. It is, a, it, is, it is a project by the community and we are inviting anyone, um, our partners, um, individuals, supporters who want to join this particular movement that we have created. We want you to pledge and come in. If your individuals do come into our platform to sign up and also take the free courses because if you learn the data literacy skills, you have nothing to lose. You're only everything to gain. Once you come onto the platform, we also have the, the platform, we have different areas where we work with enterprises. We also work with companies who are looking for data professionals. So 
this is what we would invite you to do. Join our mission to, to future-proof the world. Come in, take a look, sign a pledge. As we are developing this movement, moving this movement, uh, we have more news and more information to share, more information to share as we move forward. All right. Thank you, Mr. Hassan. So right now we have one question from the audience, which is from Nur, Ms. Nur Amani Muhammad from Malaysia. So the question sounds like this. What is the relationship between Capstone Project and Big Data? Is it clear, Mr. Yes. Hassan? Yes. All right. So let me repeat the question. What is the uh, difference between Capstone Project and Big Data? Yeah. Relationship between Capstone Project and Big Data, yes. Yes, okay. Um, big data is, is the main use of a large amount of data to, do very, to deal with very complex problems. So Capstone Project, many a time, if I understand the, 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 the asker the correctly, is when we do different courses, for example, we learn about data literacy, we, turn, we learn about how to make use of, how to use Python programming, which is quite often used in learning data analytics skills. We only learn the theory, how to make use of that. How do you make use of the, the programming to solve certain, pro certain problems? But towards the end of the course, we actually have a capstone project. That is a real live case. And we mm -hmm. share with the students and ask them to use the skills they learn to solve their problem. Sometimes depends on how big the problem is. It can take one day, it can take two days. So that is what a capstone project normally is, is to really to test your skills in the real life, in the real life case scenario, so that the skills become a lot more polished. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, to to answer you, uh, one more line is you can actually you make using big data and also analytic skills in your capstone project. So that is the relationship between the capstone project and big data. The next question is from an attendee, which is on our Facebook live. What is your view of Facebook's new platform, the Metaverse? Yes. <laughs> Metaverse, thank you. I think that is, yeah. a, is a very interesting question. It's a very good question. Um, if I can just break it down a few, a few ways. Um, Metaverse, when you go onto the internet, if you go onto Facebook, technically when you are in there, it is almost like a Metaverse already but you are not in a, in a 3D virtual world, you're not wearing a headset. But in that, you can be actually talking to your friends, uh, your family, which is in another country, many, many miles away, very far away. And today you can also talk to not just one family, you can talk to multiple families together. Now, that technically can be a metaverse, that's one. The other area which is very commonly known like a metaverse is in a gaming environment, the video gaming. Um, some of you might have heard of Roblox or Minecraft or even the very popular one, Fortnite. Practically, you are actually spending time making friends, connecting with friends in those, in those areas. And in gaming, you are you're playing, maybe you're earning some in-game currencies as well. But if you go to another, I'm not, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not advocating advertising for these companies, <laughs> I'm using this example. If you're talking about going to Minecraft or Roblox, Minecraft and Roblox, you can actually go into this platform. You can play games, but you can also build your own games. And you can build those games. You can actually allow people to come in to play at a fee. That's one way. But the second thing is what they have been doing in both platforms, they actually allow uh, entrepreneurs to go in there to build teaching class to build to build um, classrooms to teach lessons because both Minecraft and Roblox uh, are being used by the younger generation and there are some really entrepreneurial um, businessmen businesswomen they actually go in there and build a classroom and they're teaching coding some of them are teaching analytic skills as well so if you think about that um, you are going into that environment and you're learning, you're paying a fee, you're learning in that environment. And you can be learning at the same time with people from all over the world, just like we're having this talk. And there are people from yeah. different areas as well. So if you look at Metaverse that way, that means we're communicating, communicating via a virtual platform. It is very real. And coming back to what we're talking about today, big data, 
Um, okay. When you are on that platform, when you're interacting with your fellow friends and families, um, what you're doing is you're also generating, you're making a lot of decisions. You're generating a lot of data as well. Now, yes. if you are Roblox, if you are Minecraft, if you're Facebook, you are also seeing a lot of data coming in. You want to provide, build a better environment um, so that your customers can benefit from it. Now, then I want to throw it back to the audience of today. Many of them are youths. If tomorrow you want to work in one of these companies and you know that they're building metaverse, you know that data will be generated continuously in this area, would you not want to acquire data analytics skills so that you have a good chance to work in these companies? Because data generate data, uh, big data, data, data analytics is not going to go away. It will only grow yes. more and more. So one last question, inspired by the project Kite Jaga, what is your suggestion on the practical way for a non-profit organization to start utilizing big data in their efforts? All right. Mm, I think they, whether it is non-profit or profit, the very important fundamental issue is they need to address the needs. So for the non-profit, who are they trying to help first? And what kind of help they are, they, they, what kind of help they need? And if you look at, in today's context of big data, if you're helping a small community, um, so for example, in Singapore, I know that I can use that. Um, uh, there's an organization called Daughters of Tomorrow. And it's actually for women who have children at home, but they also want to work as well. They might not be able to work from nine to five because they have to look after children, yeah. but they can work in other hours. So how they actually, but the agenda is they want to help these women that who can look after the family, but also be able to work for organizations, but maybe only limited hours and maybe odd hours. So what this organization has done is they actually collect all the data from the, those people they want, to, they, 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 they want to help. And they understand what is their profile, that generally speaking, these uh, users, these, 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 these mothers, what kind of hours they can work, what kind of jobs they can do. And then they turn it and then they present it to companies that who wants to do good as well. So what they have done is, they, 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 they collect all this data and make it into insights. So companies now, they want to help those in need in society. They don't have to go and look around. They can actually just look at this. What actually happened for the Daughters of Tomorrow, this organization is, they actually um, look to companies and companies really, and really welcome what they share with them. Oh, they are these people and they are very capable um, employees. But they don't work nine to five. But, oh, but they can work maybe only between 12 o'clock to 3 p.m., only two days a week. But Daughters of Tomorrow managed to use data to work with the organizations to work out the time and to track the time, to track their performance as well. Um, so to answer your question is, you really need to look at the need, the ultimately who do you want to help? And then if you look at that, 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 that users you want to help, then you want to expand a little bit more, a little, a, little, a little bit broader. Are there similar users who can also do with this kind of help? Because if you're talking about only between five to 10 people, fine, then we can all do it in our own way, in our own small yes. way. Just like I said, if you want to expand it from five to 10 to a hundred to a thousand to 10,000, you want to help more people as all social organizations would try to do then you need to be able to understand who are you targeting and then to broaden it to see where they are and then bring them together using data to have that understanding.